It was songwriter Bart Howard who once wrote, fly me to the moon, let me play among the stars. In part one of our series following the development of Microtech's three moons this quarter, we discussed the concept phase and how the Planet Content team had a tremendous task ahead of them to take three moons from concept to completion in only a single quarter, a task that could only be made possible by recent advances in our planet tech and the last several years of efforts building up our asset and resource libraries. Now with just one day to go before presenting their work to directors in the Go No Go meeting, we sat down for part two with Patrick and Pascal to find out where they are now, how the journey has been, and if it's really possible to achieve their goals in record time before having to hand their work over to VFX artists and system designers waiting in the wings to take the three moons, Calliope, Cleo, and Euterpe, we asked, across the finish line and into Alpha 3.9. When we began working on the Planetech, we had no idea that we would land where we are right now. So the process was uh, a little different this time in comparison to uh, the entire planet rework that we have done just before CitizenCon. These three moons now are just made with the V4 with no attachment to any previous visuals that we had to accomplish. We simply could make use of the entire library that we have to our disposal, take the rocks from the caves, create snow or ice materials for them and arrange them in a different manner and then give them an entirely different look. Creating new assets for these moons. You have to see what's there, what can I do, what can I make with it, how can I reuse it, how can I make it, how can I use two old things and make one new thing out of it, basically. One of the major reasons why we went for V4 is to increase quality. We don't want to make moons faster but reduce quality. We actually want to raise both of them. If I think back to how long Lyria took us, it was two people for one month straight. But uh, Pascal, for example, in not even a month is taking on two moons. Um, I'm taking on one moon. So it is definitely a lot faster. I think for me personally, when I start working on a new planet, it's always helpful to start with what is the vibe that you get on this planet. The cool thing about these moons is the fact that we, we get like this very high level mood shot, so to say, like a concept that, that gives us a rough direction what this moon is supposed to look like. You have like really just three shots and that's basically all we have. So all of these moons have to kind of fit into that frozen snow ice theme that Microtech brings with it by default. So the first thing that you will notice when, when actually looking at every single moon individually is of course the, the slightly different color schemes, but I would say the most important feature that, that is really different is the distribution and type of ocean we have on every single one of those. So one of them has no ocean at all. The second one has an ocean that is completely frozen though, and the third one has an actually fluid ocean. So uh, that was one of the ways we could distinguish all of them and make them look interesting, but still fit into that entire theme. In the end, we really have uh, a very large uh, emotional attachment to, to these moons because they are, in fact, 90% our work and our input and our ideas. So we have the Go No Go meeting tomorrow. And um, I personally believe that uh, the moons are in a very good state. Most of the content is already there, so we have also already uh, given them out to other departments to apply content on top. So design is already working on them. VFX started touching them. Uh, so yeah, I, 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 from my point of view, I don't see a reason why there should be a no-go. <laughs> uh, what, what if it doesn't? I'll be... Uh, I'll be... Uh, then I am the liar of the year. And it's only February. <laughs> That's <But> not good. <laughs> it's no option. It has to go in. It has to go in. Right? There's, there's no such thing as a no-go. It has to happen. We will make it happen. Don't worry about it. We will make it happen.
coming to owners in the upcoming Alpha 382 is the arrival of a ship that's captured the imaginations of star citizens everywhere since it was first introduced. When adventure calls, Anvil answers, and since it's my favorite ship in the game, it's time to give you all one final tour before it makes its way into your hands. So without further ado, let's go ahead and take a ship-shaped look at some of the most notable places within the vessel in a segment we're calling, Room by Room, the Anvil Carrick. Starting on the subdeck, we enter the ship through the vehicle garage, where all Anvil owners can store their ground-based vehicles like the Ursa Rover. Now, a fun feature found here is the stopping ramp for those who tend to drive up the ramp a bit faster than perhaps they should. It remains to be seen if that'll stop me from destroying the ship from within, simply trying to park or not. Now, from the garage, we find our docking collar section that's designed for the future implementation of ship-to-ship -ship docking where it can hold EVA suits and an extendable trellis that will one day connect out with another ship and allow players to pass safely between the two. Beyond that section, we find ourselves in the three detachable cargo pods, each one capable of carrying an impressive volume of commodities. Take note of the double airlock doors that separate each one. These will be important in the future when players can drop a pod off and continue on towards another location without one. Behind the pods, we arrive in the armory. A new room and a throwback to the Carrick's history as a military vessel, complete with suit lockers, weapon racks, and all the equipment you might need before disembarking onto potentially hazardous or hostile territories. Moving up a level, we find ourselves on the habitation deck, and a place I'll probably experience most, the med bay. Now in the waiting room out here, we have some standard beds, office and utility areas off to the side, and a single medical bed that's a step up in capabilities from what you'll find on the Cutlass Red. Also on the habitation deck, you can't be a big ship in the Star Citizen universe without your mess hall. The rec room, where Anvil seems to have invented hard mode for billiards with a six-sided table, and military-style crew quarters or billets, complete with all the amenities a person could need on extended voyages like bathrooms and showers and such. On our way to the bridge, we find the captain's quarters, full of many important books that make you seem learned to your crew as well as a hideaway television so they don't actually see what you're really doing with your time. After that, we find ourselves where all the action happens on board the Carrick with our multi-level bridge that spans both the second and third floors. Now down below, you'll find the pilot and co-pilot stations, as well as a variety of server blades that will one day assist players with the processing of data that you collect while exploring the cosmos. Up above on the technical deck, we have the comms and remote gunner stations, our star map, and an alternate pilot station, providing greater visibility at reduced instrumentation. Also, you gotta stand there the whole time, and I don't trust anyone with a standing desk as a rule of thumb. I'm very, very pro chairs. From the bridge, we move past a couple more escape pods into the repair room, where you'll be able to service and maintain your various ship components on the extended voyages a ship like the Carrick is intended for. And then the drone room, with its two drone operator seats and the release mechanism that will jettison them into space without venting the entire room. Also on the technical deck, we find our ship hangar, capable of launching the included Anvil Pisces or anything else you find will fit. And we're not going to take that discovery away from you. If you can get it in there and close the doors above it, have at it, fellow space person. Past the hangars, we find access to the Carrick's side turrets. Now, one of the things we discovered during our CitizenCon demo was how difficult it was to get onto your targets. So we've actually extended the distance the turrets extend out from the ship, improving the angles you can work with. At the rear of the ship, we find engineering, which, like the bridge at the fore, extends between the technical deck and the habitation below it. It's here you'll find many of the ship's components like shield generators, power plants, and the like. Finally, taking one of the Carrick's many lifts or ladders up to the very top brings us to the cartography deck, which will, in the future, showcase the star system you're currently presiding in and allow an operator to plot courses and the like with a much more detailed map than you'd normally see on other ships. And for those that just need to stretch their legs, an EVA airlock that lets you escape out into space at the top of the ship and I'm sure won't become a popular ingress target for wannabe raiders in the future. And since we're outside at this point, let's go ahead and take one more look at the Carrick exterior while we're here. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the progression of the Carrick's exterior, I encourage you to check out both the CitizenCon Ship Talk panel, as well as concept artist Sarah McCullough's recent appearance on Star Citizen Live to find out more. 
It's a good looking ship, if I do say so myself. I'm really glad it's my favorite. So what do we learn this week? Well, we learned that game development is exponential, and where it would once take an entire team months to create a single planet, two devs can now create most of three moons in a matter of weeks. And that the Anvil Carrick is love, the Anvil Carrick is life, the Anvil Carrick is coming in Alpha 382, and if it isn't already by the time this airs, don't forget you can check it out on the PGU early when it arrives. For Inside Star Citizen, I'm Jared Huckabee. We'll see you next week. Calliope, Cleo, and Uterpe. I meant to find out how to say that before we recorded, and I didn't. Hold on. The YouTube pronunciation is Uterpe. Uterpe? Yeah, yeah. Uterpe? Yeah, Uterpe. Uterpe?